So I'm sitting there and the canopy pods over, it's wet, it's loud. But suddenly I hear knock, knock, knock on the side of the canopy. And I couldn't see anybody coming. I was next to a highway. And I look over, and there's a guy in sweatpants and a, and a hoodie. And I see blue and red lights flashing. And I'm like, oh. oh. And he goes, hi, my name's Sergeant Sovinso. I'm an off-duty officer. I called an ambulance because you crashed. This is Soaring the Sky, a Glider Pilots podcast, coming to you from the Mid-Atlantic region here in the United States and bringing you great soaring content from glider pilots all over the globe. We now join Chuck and our guest pilot. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for joining us for another soaring adventure. First, I do want to thank each and every one of you for helping us reach another huge milestone we are now well over 200,000 downloads, and that's because of you. Thank you for that. I am humbled you continue to meet and exceed my expectations for this podcast. The support and encouragement we receive daily from all over the world pushes us to keep going. You know, we all have those days, and I'd be lying if I said I haven't. You don't know how much it means when you're struggling, and then you get an encouraging email or message on social media or positive review of the show. So if you haven't yet, please leave us a review. Hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. Let's get into this new episode. Keith is a super interesting guy. So many stories to share. We could have talked for hours, to be honest. Like getting shot at in Afghanistan while on final. And then another story he shared is finding lift while he's piloting an airliner. Actually saving his company hundreds of dollars on fuel because of his knowledge as a glider pilot. He also brings us some huge safety tips. This was super interesting. You're going to love this for glider pilots as well as tow pilots that we're all definitely going to benefit from. His current job is with Cal Fire Flying Tankers, and of course he has some stories about that as well. Sergio is here today. Hello, Sergio. What do you have for us this time? Hi, Chuck. In our last episode, we talked about major soaring goals setting for the year ahead and for every pilot out there planning to accomplish the silver badge today's segment is for you thank you sergio we're going to definitely look forward to hearing that after our chat with keith so let's get into this episode hello keith welcome to the podcast hey thanks for having me chuck glad to be here yeah absolutely i had a lot of fun talking to you earlier in our pre-interview we're going to get into some of those some of those fun stories that you shared briefly, but I know you're going to get into more detail. So as always, you know, of course, we want to know how this all got started for you. So um, I guess my aviation story really began with my grandfather. He was a uh, grasshopper pilot in World War II, and he spotted artillery. And so flying was always kind of in the family. Um, Oh, wow. And so as a young kid, I was always interested in it. And uh, so what I have, what I did about when I was 10 years old or so here in Southern California is I started sneaking down to my local airport and uh, would hang out there just to watch the aircraft, was super interested in it. And at one point, a guy came up to me who had been working with his uh, aerial advertising uh, banners and came up oh, to nice. me and, and he's pretty cool, kind of, you know, I'll do a crotchety the old character. He goes, hey, kid what are you doing? You know, I'm watching the airplanes. He goes, Oh, Hey, uh, I really need some help with these banners. You, you might give me a hand. I'll give you, you know, I'll give you a couple of bucks. You know, 10 years old at the time. I'm like, heck yeah. I got to hang out between the taxiway and the runway and, uh, ended up working for a guy for about 10 years, had a really close relationship with him. And, um, so what I did is I was, you know, a ground pounder putting banners together, take them apart. I'd wash and fuel the airplanes get them out in the field, get the, get the airplanes launched and recovered throughout the day. And that kind of became my summer job. And that's actually what paid for most of my flying lessons. Um, my private, my, uh, instrument and my commercial was all through working for, for this guy named Banner Joe. Ah, very cool. Yeah. And so I think the only thing my parents actually paid for 
initially was uh, my private pilot check ride. And when I went to my first airline later on, they bought me a jacket. And so I kind of worked hard and paid my own way. And one of Joe's uh, pilots had towed gliders as well. And I remember distinctly as a kid, he goes, hey, Keith, you know, did you get your commercial and you want to go fly in some windy conditions up in the mountains here, you know, head up to this glider port and, and talk to those guys. And that stayed with me for a long time. And eventually after I got my commercial, I wasn't insurable. And he had a Stearman, he had an AGCAT and a Cessna 182. And I wasn't insurable to tow banners for him yet. So my, my first summer, I actually was towing gliders a little bit. And then went back to banner towing and kind of flip-flop back and forth for a few seasons. Uh... That's how I got started. After a number of hours later on, went off to, uh, got my multi-instrument commercial add-on. Uh, I flew cargo and metro liners. Um, on a DOD contract. From there, I went to SkyWest Airlines, which everybody kind of knows about. I ended up flying skydivers, and I still kind of do while I was a Brasilia captain at SkyWest. Uh-huh. And eventually wanted to fly air tankers, left SkyWest, flew P3 Orion. Uh, and then that company went out of business, so I was out of work. And that's how I ended up going to Afghanistan. I flew there for a year as a uh, contract pilot in the King Air. Went to Spirit Airlines for five years and kind of had the firefighting bug. So I went back and now that's where I'm at. But uh, all through this, the last 21 years or so, I've I've been towing gliders, flight instructing in them, flying cross countries and uh, really loving it. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll do it for a long, long time. Wow. You know, one of the things talking to you in our pre-interview, you mentioned that you'd also had a video on uh, tow pilot safety and of course, we always like to touch a little bit, of course, on safety. It's very important, but I'll put a link in the show notes so our listeners can check that out. But we know that the pilot and the tow pilot, of course, put their lives in each other's hands with every flight. Can you talk about some things that you feel is super important that you've learned along the way, not only as a tow pilot, but also as a glider pilot that we all could learn from? Yeah, um, I have about a little over 10,000 toes over these last 20-something years and learned quite a bit, figured quite a bit out on my own, talking to other DPEs, flight instructors and gliders and things. I got into an online debate about the safety of Schweitzer tow hooks, and I'm sure you've seen that before. And so what I did is I didn't want to come up with the standard, try to identify some actual problems through data. And I didn't want to come up with a standard, do your checklist, be careful, because I felt like that was kind of given safety lip service, so to speak. Right. And I wanted to dive deeper into these toe upsets, issues with tow pilots, glider pilots, things that were affecting safety that we all know about. And so I'll kind of tell you that I, I put my money where my mouth is. So I kind of did a little research, did a little testing, consulted with a bunch of friends and then, you know, and, and industry experts. And we kind of came up with a bunch of things. And what I ended up doing with that is I developed a video and it's about 30 minutes long. It's a pretty long diatribe where I get, uh, I get into the weeds a little bit. And I also wrote in the May, 2021 soaring magazine, I wrote an open forum article on tow pilot safety and it sort of complements that video that I had posted on YouTube. And so what I did is I, I have a Cessna 180 and I have a Schweitzer tow hook on it. And I went out to the airport and I used a giant fish scale, and at the time I had a big dually truck tied the airplane down. I actually pulled up on my tow hook about 1,100 pounds of force with a oh, wow. fish scale, and a, I used an engine hoist. It was it was kind of comical <laughs> if you see the article. It's kind of like you know a little rinky dink. Um, and the reason I didn't go to 1,200 pounds is because it was getting pretty terrifying to do this pull. <laughs> And sure. I know these types of tests had been done in the past and it wasn't well documented. And so I wanted to throw something out there for everybody. And that's what we did. So I ended up 50 degree angle. We measured that out with a protractor. It took about 30, 33 pounds of force, I believe, with a standard Schweitzer tow hook in my airplane. And we were able to release with that real high angle. Oh, okay. And yeah. so wow. I said, I said, okay, yeah, I've, I've had people tell me, you know, I've done this test in the seventies or some crazy thing. I'm like, well, where's, have you written it down? I go, well, no, it's okay. So I want to go do that for everybody. And I did. 
And from there, what I did is I said, okay, I need to dive into all of these accidents that are supposedly happening. And so I, I spent probably three days going through 78 NTSB accidents since I, and don't quote me on this, since the uh, early 80s, I think, is what the NTSB had gone back to. And of 78 accidents involving tow planes, um, eight of them were fatal. And so I said, okay, I want to concentrate on those. Some were tailwheel shimmy, low time tailwheel pilot, you know, went off the runways, you know, flat tires, engine failure, stuff like that. You know, running right. out of gas was a huge one in Pawnees, and I couldn't believe it. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I and that's how I felt. I was like, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? But the fatalities that had happened is what I concentrated on. And we had one that was a dust devil. The glider got high, and the tow pilot didn't activate the release. They didn't say what kind of hook. Uh, oh. was on that the other one was another one where the tow plane pitched up which i thought was really interesting huh. um yeah, that is interesting. the glider release with the tow plane above them and then the pawnee spun into the ground so i'm like okay that's strange um yeah, well. yeah we had a call error and i'll just kind of read you know give you the quick the quick uh, synopsis on these glider got high um there's no evidence that tow pilot tried to release and once the glider did the tow plane spun in and you know the tow pilot's got the stick all the way back glider releases and yeah and uh, it's easy to kind of snap roll in one was just low altitude 20 30 feet not a lot of time there was another pawnee high glider had a guillotine no attempt to use a guillotine a scout had a guillotine no evidence one wow. was, appears to be a medical impairment and the last one was another super cub that pitched up for unknown reasons the glider released and the cub crash. So what huh. was weird is I found there was no smoking gun of yeah, issues right. with tow hooks, whether they're Schweitzer or tossed or guillotine. And there was, there was no prejudice towards one hook with these accidents. And so that I found was pretty interesting. So from there, we kind of dove in and, and the two big takeaways were, you know, tow pilots aren't, aren't flying their aircraft after they have these events and the glider releases. Yeah. And they're not activating the release in time. And that's kind of what I, I, I commented in the video, you know, the military, the early days of ejection seats, just trying to convince their pilots to eject was hard. And we're kind of some similarities there. And then they all kind of, you know, these things that do happen stem from guys just getting high on tow because they're distracted or they give the, canopy lip service and the checklist before they take off and it opens on them and they they get distracted you know things like that so yeah um, those were the two big takeaways and uh, i i was pretty surprised and I, I went into quite a bit of detail in the video if your listeners want to take a look at that and it, it got quite a bit of views and i hope that it helped somebody improve tow pilot safety along the way I'm actually teaching my niece, who's 24 years old, to tow in a Super Cub right now. And I'm handling oh, wow, very cool. these types of things. Yeah. So <laughs> I make her touch the release before every takeoff. You know, Super Cub releases are kind of on the floor. They're not really in a convenient place. You know, just different things like that. You know, cable stretch. We talk about, you know, at, at my glider port, we drop the rope at the end of the day. We taxi by the office. And it's a little baby click. And we taxi down and park. And the line boy or girl wraps up the rope. And when it comes to these releases, which I've had to release two with the Schweitzer hook, it's a pretty brisk, rapid, hard pull. And, and you've got to get all the, you got to tighten up the cable and stretch it from slack. So the, the point where the glider releases is really far back in the release handle. It's just not where you're used to. Yeah. Um, wow. And so we're kind of subconsciously as tow pilots training ourselves incorrectly how to deal with this inevitable emergency that we're going to have at some point in our towing career. And so I just kind of pointed that out. I talked about tow hook maintenance, tow hook repairs. I've seen banners hang up on AM3 bolts. When the Brad fitting breaks on a tow hook, everyone just throws an AM3 bolt in there. And the ring uh, will actually get hung up on the bolt head or the nut. And I've seen our right. we had a really nice 450 steerman that landed with a banner on it. Luckily, the airplane's so heavy, it just, it just didn't care. But you could see the potential issues with that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I... 
I dove in quite a bit in, in an attempt to kind of give back to the sport a little bit, regardless of your tow hooks, you know, what, what system you've got on your aircraft, just, just trying to do something for the sport, I guess you could say. Yeah. I mean, we could do a whole episode on that. That's super interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely put the link in there. That's definitely worth watching. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's just, you know, when I teach my students, Chuck, you know, we teach proverbial 200 foot rope break. Oh, and, and it's, it's fun as an instructor, you know, you see right. a student jump and it's like, okay, yeah. all right. And, <laughs> And it's, you know, I just kind of chuckle and I'm like, oh, by the way, don't, you know, don't flash into the ground here, you know, do this, do the yeah. maneuver, let's get it done. <laughs> and then what I do is I use that as, as a training opportunity. It's not really about them doing the maneuver. It's more about we land and we debrief it. And so, you know, you jump pretty high. I would too. And I want to get people in the mindset that they should not be surprised that their rope broke. They should be surprised that their rope did not break. And I do right. that every takeoff, yeah. you know, I'll be yep. 232 doing a ride and I go, Oh, cool. It didn't break. This is great. Yep. Um, and for the tow pilots, I've adopted that same philosophy over the years is, is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty quick. If I need to get on that release, I'm expecting that glider pilot to get high on me and I'm going to yeah. take care of them as soon as I can. So I think that little paradigm shift in thought, you know, if, don't be surprised when it happens, be surprised when it doesn't. And that was one of the main messages that I was attempting to get across, you know, and the bummer is you can't really train for it, you know, and it's kind of every man or woman for themselves in that tow plane. Yeah. And, yeah. That's uh, right. So, so, you know, how do we train a glider pilot or a tow pilot to recognize the things that are leading up to this accident before it happens? You know, it's that proverbial, you know, aviation, you get the, you know, you get the test before you get the lesson, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, that was, exactly. that was kind of my motivation behind all of that. Well, thanks for doing that. I think that's, that's helped out a lot of people and will help out a lot more people if they check out that, that video. There's a lot there. Yeah, I, I hope so. So Keith, this is a question that has brought us some great stories and even some scary stories here on the podcast. So what are some of your most memorable flights in the glider or even in the tow plane? You know, I've had I've had a bunch. I've towed a Cessna 180. I've towed a Grobe 103 from Texas to Southern California. I have some straight out flights from Southern California up the Owens Valley, landing in Lone Pine um, in my ASW 19, and my dad chasing me with his 180 with a tow hook. But you know, honestly, it, it's it's kind of funny. In 20 something years of flying gliders, I've never landed I've landed off, but I've never landed off an airport until this past summer. Oh well, wow, really. Interesting. Yeah, which, which, you know, out here in California, if you're on top of a hill, you're probably within glide of an airport. And so yeah. landed off plenty of times, but never off field. And, okay. you know, as a longtime instructor, nearly 20 years now, it's kind of funny teaching these off field landings. And, and I've done them in my 180. You know, my wife and I love to go camp off airport and some of my friends and land on dirt roads and things like that. But uh, I was actually at the, uh, Clubcraft Nationals in Moriarty, hosted by uh, Mitch and Kim and Hudson out there. And, you know, we're racing around the course. And I entered this, before I entered this valley, I look and I said, okay, there's three or four fields out there. And it's, it's a low day. If you look at the race, it was pretty challenging through the whole, the whole race. I think half of us landed out two or three times throughout the week. And so I see a couple of gliders out ahead and I'm going to do my first land out and I kind of run my checklist, you know, wind, wire, slope, surface. And there's a gust front with a rain squall coming from one side and there's three or four gliders above me, maybe six, 700 feet. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to just pull in there and catch a whopping two or three knots, climb up, push off to the east and get right into the sunshine and everything's going to be great. You know, obviously we know that's, wishful thinking and yes, it's not a, <laughs> it's not a strategy, <laughs> but right. I had, I had somewhere safe to go and the weather's coming in and these are big, you know, monsoon, New Mexico style thunderstorms that are rolling through the, the entire concept. So I'm like, well, here it is. Here's my first land out, you know, coming up and I had about seven or 800 feet of field that was lined up fairly towards the rain. Cause my thought was, well, I'm going to come in over the power lines. I'm going to land, you know, there's no wind indicator. So I'm assuming any kind of gust is going to be coming from the rain towards my nose. And so, you know, I developed the whole plan, 
you know, we do a, a, a thing in the airlines where you do what's called MEAN, and it's just an acronym for you do memory items, emergency, abnormals, and normals. And so come up with your pre-landing, you know, your uh, off-field checklist, and then make sure you run through our normal checklist. You know, gear flaps, wind, airspeed, trim, traffic, spoilers. That's, that's what we use where I teach. And great, I did all that. But something I want to stress was kind of an interesting single pilot crew resource management was I had uh, Tony Condon, who I, I believe you've talked to in the past. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. He was above me in that thermal and I was, I was cursing him because he stole all my lift. And he was an <laughs> awesome cross country pilot, great, great competitor. And even though I'd done all this stuff and I got thousands of hours and been flying gliders a long time, I just used a little CRM and there was Tony and another friend of mine, Sylvia above me. And I said, Hey, here's my plan. I'm going to do left traffic, come over the wires here. I've got those in sight over this tree. I'm going to land at this angle towards the rain. And all I did was I said, Hey, you know, of course you had a contest and it's a safety related call. And I just said, does what I'm about to do make sense? Because, you know, my heart rate's up a little bit and I'm focused and I just want to make right. sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah. And Tony just said, you know, that sounds like a great plan. He's like, good luck. <laughs> it's like, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Like, okay, you know, because you're kind of on your own. But that was something yeah. kind of interesting was we, we don't think about crew resource management or single pilot resource management. We fly gliders. So it was a, a great story of a stressful situation where I've been in plenty of those in other parts of my career. But just just something maybe the readers could use is always use your buddy to, you know, back you up. Yeah, absolutely. So I ended up landing. I touched down. I, you know, I radio, hey, you know, I'm, everything's good. Your pilot's fine. Glider's fine. I said, great, man. And I jump out, check the glider visually. Gear doors are still on. Landed in a really decent field. And then the rain hits. So I run and hide back in the glider. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm, my, you know, of course, I'm in like Columbia lightweight gear and everything. And I luckily, I, I do fly with a shell jacket when I'm out in monsoon weather. So I can kind of stay somewhat dry. Of course, it was under my seat while I was out running around in the rain checking the aircraft <laughs> yeah oh my god okay great so i jump in freezing cold put the jacket on over me and i huddle down thinking okay this little guy this squall line's gonna gonna move through in 10 or 15 minutes i'll call my crew which is my niece that i'm teaching to tow and call the retreat desk and so i'm sitting there and the canopy fogs over it's wet it's loud and suddenly i hear knock 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 on the side of the canopy and i couldn't <laughs> see anybody coming i was next to a highway and I look over, and there's a guy in sweatpants and a, and a hoodie. And I see blue and red lights flashing. And I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> and he goes, hi, my name's Sergeant Sovinsov, I'm an off-duty officer. I've called an ambulance because you've crashed. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and, and so, you know, I was like, oh, boy, here we go. Here comes the Calvary. And I said, no, yeah. let's, let's, let's fix the terminology. I haven't crashed. I've landed. I'm okay. I was just trying to stay out of the weather. And this poor officer doing his job, he was awesome, came over and he said, uh, you know, he said, okay, well, I'm going to run back to my cruiser and get out of the rain. So this guy came out for me, was soaking wet, you know, trodden through the nice. mud and the grass and everything. Yeah. Um, wow. Ended up spending some time in a cruiser trying to get warm and all that good stuff. So overall, it, it was fun. It was a mass land out day. I think half the field got shot down again that day. And you know, it was frustrating and fun at the same time. And I think a third of the land outs had contact with law enforcement. It was a pretty, pretty comical day for the contest and for everybody. But, um, <laughs> All right. But yeah, the, the big thing is just the safety aspect. You know, that's really what I like to push is, is I use oh, that yeah. CRM to, to make sure I wasn't missing something. Yeah. You know, of course, we love to focus most of the podcasts on soaring, but I do want to hear some stories about your day job because you are the first tanker pilot we've had here fighting fires on the podcast. You know, as a kid growing up in northern Minnesota, I briefly had mentioned to you, yeah, I remember seeing these large planes fly over and we're out in the middle of nowhere, of course, and they're dropping water and they're fire retardant just behind our cabin. I'm looking up, you know, curious. Definitely want to hear about your adventures in the cockpit of those large birds. Yeah, it's um, hands down the greatest aviation job uh, in the world. I mean, I was an Airbus captain and left the pinnacle of everybody's idea of the pinnacle of their career and, and went back to aerial firefighting 
it, it truly is the best job in the world. I mean, you know, at the airlines, it's, you know, where's my bag? Why can't we fly in thunderstorms? You know, why are we late? Things like that. And, and at the airline, at the firefighting, I've had people write letters or come to the tanker base and, hey, thanks for saving. That was my grandparents' cabin. Or you saved my house up there on that road up at, you know, XYZ, you know, city. Um, here's a bottle of wine. Here's, uh, you know, I've gotten gift cards for Outback Steakhouse. So you actually feel like you're making a difference. I really, really enjoy it. Plus, I no longer fly red eyes, so I feel like a human being again. You know, we're, we're all daytime. Right. Um, <laughs> but I, I love it. What I do is I, I fly Grumman S2. It's 29,000 pounds, uh, single pilot, public use aircraft. We haul up to 1,200 gallons of retardant. Wow. What we do is we sit like a, we're a flying fire truck. So here in the state of California, where I, I work for Cal Fire, and what we do is we sit loaded because our response areas are not like the fed guys have to go really far. So um, they don't sit loaded. You might be in California and get told to go to Florida, you know, or, or to where you're at. And so hauling the load, you know, 1500 miles yeah. isn't feasible. So as a result, we get off the ground really fast. So within about five minutes of someone hanging up with 911, we're airborne, we're underway, usually a, air attack platform, a couple of tankers and a helicopter. We just rush uh, to the fire. We get out there as quick as we can and the system works well. So it is as far as really fun stories. I mean, probably one of the most memorable I had is, you know, 2020 was a pretty busy season out here. We flew a lot uh, in California, which you may have seen on the news. And we were working the river fire out near Monterey, Salinas Valley, and a new fire popped up. And so we got diverted to that you know, pretty chaotic. The, the fire weather conditions were causing rapid rates of spread and things were dynamic and happening fast. And I remember being in the orbit and I see a guy just throwing stuff into his, into his car. And it's kind of oh, a rural man. community. And he's just running around like a madman throwing, throwing a few items in his car. And he's got a kind of this gentle S turning downhill driveway that leads to the main road, you know, probably six, 700 feet and fire with flame lengths of six to 10 feet, just rushing through the grass, getting ready to overrun him as he's running down his driveway. And I remember starting between the fire and his house and just going between him and his driveway and just taking the heat out of the fire so the guy could get out of there. Um, And so, you know, a lot of our, our, our drops we do and a lot of our job is it's not really on the news. You don't see it. That means we did our job right. But every once in a while you have a drop like that or, or a situation where, you know, it's, it's life property and natural resources. And when your top priority is life, um, it feels great to, to get in there, do your job and, and help somebody out. And then more often than not, we're saving homes and structures and things like that. And that's, that's kind of the meat and potatoes of what we do is try to get out there, hit the fires quick and hard and, and prevent them from growing. It's definitely the greatest job in the world. I, I really enjoy it. So I have to ask, what are you feeling up in the cockpit? I mean, does it, does it get hot? How close to the fires are you guys getting? I know you're staying safe, but how does, how does that work? Yeah. So um, just imagine the smoke column is a really violent thermal. Um, <laughs> you know, we try wow, to stay in the smoke. <laughs> I, I mean, you get hammered sometimes. Um, so, uh, we get in there, we get buckled down and, and go, but I, I will say that in all the things from airline to cargo and, you know, I've dodged mountain wave over the Rockies and an Airbus, you know, because of my knowledge of wave and meanwhile, other pilots and airlines are complaining about the ride and. I'm giving my 200 passengers a smooth ride because of my soaring experience. Yeah. I've climbed in wave in a jet, save the company, you know, 1500 pounds of fuel. Nice. (laughs) But you know, the off airport stuff soaring is it's a transferable skill really to, to everything else fixed wing and aviation, but more so than ever with the aerial firefighting. I wrote an article for Sean, who is the owner of Wings and Wheels. And yep. I wrote mm-hmm. an article called Transferable Skill Soaring for him. And in the firefighting, it's it's pretty neat because you kind of have to, the soaring gives you the ability to, as you can imagine, to kind of see or have a pretty good guess 
of what the sky is doing right next to the ground where we're operating low level. I, I try to tell and create a fun story of how the sky and the ground was interacting and the pilot and the aircraft and the seat of the pants and how all those things are kind of a, a living organism that you're all one being and kind of try to write almost kind of a poetic way to describe what aerial firefighting is all about. And uh, CAL FIRE's done a great job. We have angle of attack indicators in the aircraft. So when it's turbulent and bumpy, you know, we kind of have our airspeed for energy potential, but we got our angle of attack where we'll increase our angle of attack to slide the airplane three to 4,000 feet a minute down the hillside safely. And the S2 is a fantastic airplane. Imagine a 29,000 pound Cessna 172. I mean, it just flies phenomenally uh, well. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great aircraft, but you know, I'm based in Porterville, which is north of uh, Bakersfield, California. And we go to the Owens Valley, as you know, everyone's running mountain wave up there in the gliders. Right. You know, trying to get a, a heavy tanker on a 110 degree day up and over the Sierras, an aircraft that was designed to fly at 500 feet and look for submarines. It's a lot of work. And I fly the tanker like a glider out in the Sierras. I mean, I will, I'll see a line of cues that's kind of on the way within five or 10 degrees of the fire I'm going to. And I'll get up under the cues and, and use the lift to climb. You know, you're in a turbine airplane at those altitudes, barely climbing three, 400 feet a minute. And so you can see how the knowledge, a good knowledge of soaring is a huge help in that job. And then the low level environment, whether it's on the, the front or the lee side of a mountain, you know, we kind of, everything we do in soaring with mountain flying and all that, we kind of throw the book out the window sometimes to do our job. But man, it is all relatable to soaring, hands down. Probably the uh, soaring has been the most important thing in that respect. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So back into the gliders, and thank you for sharing mm -hmm. those stories. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, that's pretty incredible. Wings and Wheels has been serving the soaring and sport aviation community for over 30 years. They hands down have the largest and most comprehensive inventory of sailplane and soaring supplies in North America and they ship globally. Nearly everything you'll find on their site is in stock and ready for same-day shipping. Wings and Wheels is the exclusive American representative for HPH sailplanes. Be sure to check out the Twin Shark, their latest launch. They're also now the exclusive distributor in North America for the new Just Soaring Glider Sim Pro. The team has thousands of hours of flying experience in gliders and airplanes, staffed by Adam, Kelly, Julie, and Sean. A friendly voice will answer when you call or email them. Check them out at wingsandwheels.com. Out of all the gliders you've flown so far, what sailplanes have you enjoyed flying the most and why? And, and maybe even what would be your dream glider? Yeah, so I've, you know, I'm not, I'm not picky. As you know, I've, I've just purchased a Ventus 3. I've gotten a whopping two flights in it on about a half knot day, just testing everything out. And it's fantastic, but I have had some fantastic memories in events flying my ASW-19. Um, I've had that glider for about 10 years from straight outs to the Owens Valley from here in Southern California. I've been to three or four contests in it, trying to teach and promote the sort of sport of soaring, finding that new guy in the airport and kind of lead and follow like, Hey, I'll get you out of glide for your first time. And as a CFI doing a little ground lesson and then, you know, just stretching their comfort zone to where they're safe and getting them out, you know, away from the airport for the first time. I really love that stuff. I, I like giving back to the sport. Very cool. But I will say the Shemphurst Mini Moa built in the thirties. That would be, I love that classic gold wing design. That would be my dream glider. If, if somebody had one and I was able to fly it, that would be awesome. You know, every, everybody loves a P-51 and my, if I won the lottery dream aircraft, it would actually be a Corsair. I love those kind of classic looking lines on aircraft like that. So definitely a, a mini MOA would be amazing. Nice. It's very cool. A first, but that's awesome. Yeah. At some point in our chats, you know, we always like to give our guests a chance to give a shout out to those who've been influential, of course, in their aviation story. Would you like to do that, Keith, at this time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hands down, with, without a doubt, uh, the Willett family of Sky Sailing. Um, I started working for them 11 days after 9-11, and uh, tanker pilot, you know, airline captain, 
flying in Afghanistan, I've always come back and worked for the Willits. Um, and I still try to instruct and tow for them as much as I can. Um, but they've been instrumental in kind of that initial time building phase. So, you know, I'm, I'm the only non-family member that's allowed to fly their personal aircraft. Um, and I've used it for either trips or ratings. They've given me a place to stay for years when I was kind of full-time time building. And, you know, like many glider ports, it's out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I was just a poor teenager trying to make ends meet and build flight time. So, and even to this day, you know, their, their son Garrett's helped me tremendously with, uh, you know, the Ventus purchase and maintenance and things like that. And the younger brother, Boyd, uh, he is my partner tanker pilot at my airbase. Um, and so I've known Boyd since he's 10 years old. So it's pretty cool to go out and fight fire with him together. Um, no, that's but cool. yeah, Brett and Karen, the whole family has been amazing. You know, you mentioned Afghanistan and, and I have to get back to that for a second yeah. because you briefly we had briefly talked about it. You had mentioned a story when you were there. You actually came under fire. I think you said when you were coming in on final. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So um, I was flying King Airs out there on a contract. And uh, I'll just start with, with going over there as a contractor, civilian, and seeing what our armed forces are doing for us really gave me a whole new respect for, for what those guys are doing for us. Yeah, I was on final. Uh, following i want to say it was a, a c-17 or something like that and uh the guy just small arms fire we have a flare package on the aircraft and started taking small arms fire and saw tracers coming up around just king air and i'm like man i'm kind of small fish you know what are you doing here put the yeah. gear and the flaps up put the power up to you know the turbine temps up to red line and and dove and just sped up as fast as the airplane would go you know right up to red line and uh, got over the air base and uh but it was pretty interesting. It, it, it kind of made it real, you know, probably small fish to to some of what your listeners may have experienced being in the military and fighting. But um, gave me a whole new respect for that. And uh, yeah, you kind of just walk around on the ground, you know, rocket attacks, mortar attacks were just kind of a daily occurrence. And then you almost can't. Yeah, wow. You almost get numb to it. But uh, yeah, quite the experience. I was I was glad I went. Gave me a whole new respect for you know the men and women in uniform. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we're going to get into our lightning round if you're up to it. Okay, let's do it. So basically ask you some quick questions. Give me some quick answers. And if there's any that you'd like to pass on, Keith, of course, you can do that. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. If you could only pick one, what glider port or region would be at the top of your bucket list of places to go soaring and why? Uh, I would say something like Saint Avon, the French Alps. I want to go over to Europe okay. and do some flying. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Yeah. I've had a friend do that. Nice. What's the highest altitude you've ever been in a glider, and where was it? Um, out here at Warner Springs, eighteen thousand feet. You know, or seventeen nine nine nine. Not beautiful. It, in fact, I just finally got my wife up on a wave flight and do a discus and took her up to eighteen thousand feet a few weeks ago. Oh, nice. P tube, P bag, diaper, or P out the window? Uh, man, I'm converting from from tube to uh, to bag now. <laughs> you know, a lot of corroded rudders out there, so I'm kind of the the Ventus is going to have a bag system. <laughs> if you could fly your glider only at one bank angle, other than level, what would it be? Uh, Forty five degrees. Nice. What's your favorite type of lift to all things equal? Thermal, wave, ridge, or convergence? Um, you know, I would say uh, convergence. We do a lot of that out here. What's the strangest or most spectacular thing you've ever seen in the glider cockpit or, because of your very interesting job, a powered aircraft? Ooh. Um, other than paragliders up near the clouds at, you know, really high altitudes, I'd say... Uh, Fast moving military aircraft in the airlines, watching guys, I'm doing Mach 80 and watching guys pass me pretty rapidly in the dark. Nice. Wow. What's the worst place you've ever landed out and why did it suck? Ooh, um, man, I would have to say, uh, I, I don't think any of it sucked. 
I just, I kind of laugh at it. I'm like, oh, well, you kind of messed that one up, didn't you? Um, <laughs> well, that's good. But, but anywhere mid Saturday when all the tow pines are busy and you can't get a retrieve right away. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you had to pick one thing for lower hours glider pilots and they're trying to learn how to thermal more efficiently and effectively, what would be your advice to them? Bank steeper. Nice. Yeah. Most, most, most glider pilots, uh, student glider pilots, they, um, they bank pretty shallow. Yeah, for sure. Money, no object, and you could only spend it on a glider. What dream glider would you buy, and what do you like about it? <laughs> well, the Ventus 3 is my dream glider, um, but I will nice. say, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm loving that thing. But I will That's say, because awesome. I like sharing the sport, how about a uh, an Arcus? Okay. Or yeah. something like that, a nice two-seater. Right. Yeah, two-seaters are always nice to share the ride. Yes, absolutely. Keith, that about wraps it up, but I am uh, so grateful you joined us today to talk about your aviation journey and definitely an interesting day job, and we haven't interviewed anyone doing that. So that was some great, great, great stuff hearing those stories. Thank you for that. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And I always bug our guest again, you know, so... You'll probably be getting a call from me in the future. Say, hey, what have you been up to? You got any interesting stories that have happened? What What's your latest uh, flight? In your yeah, absolutely. Flight? And uh, you know, I, I would encourage uh, I would encourage the, the uh, your listeners to uh, you know I, I push the safety thing. Obviously, is uh, you know don't strive for mediocrity, hoping you'll get there. Strive for excellence, knowing you'll never get there. And that's whether you're a tow pilot, glider pilot, power pilot. Don't settle. Keep learning. That's some great advice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right, Keith, you take care. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Sergio from Sorry Master here. If you are planning to fly cross-country for the first time this year, most probably you are going to fly your first 50-kilometer navigation for a silver badge. And the silver badge is the first challenge of our soaring careers, and as anything new, uh, it will most certainly cause some apprehension. So let me share with you some lessons learned from my own first 50 kilometer flight. Back in 2010, I was looking to accomplish the last task of my silver badge, the 50k kilometer flight in a sailplane. There I was, a fresh pilot with my flight license in hand. Having followed my club's workflow, I did my precision landing training, my five-hour flight, and I was free to declare my 50K attempt whenever I identified a good window, and I would fly it on my club's SZD51 Junior. Well, Saturday looked good, and I picked a route which had two airfields at my disposal and with my sailplane set, off we go. I took off and released from tow plane and it was clear that the forecast had overestimated the conditions. The cloud base was way lower but the thermal intensity was good so I decided to turn my first turn point which was near my airfield and see whether the conditions improved or not. Well. When I turned the turn point, it became clear that if I wanted to have a try, I would have to buy a low navigation, varying from 3,000 feet to 1,500 feet, in between uh, 1,000 and 500 meters. Not ideal for a first attempt, but not impossible either. So I decided to go. Leaving the gliding cone for the first time felt strange. And even with alternatives and good conditions ahead, you feel it. And if you're going to do this for the first time this year, know that this feeling will be there. But if things look good ahead, keep going. Uh, during the navigation, I got low once, but I had an airfield in the middle of my route for that case. That's when good planning pays off, so plan your route as to have as many alternatives at hand as possible. After climbing again, I noticed that the conditions ahead over my last turn point, over my 
kilometer turn point had deteriorated. The turn point was in the middle of the blue. Well, I was 10 kilometers away from the turn point. And I climbed to the top, the nearest thermal, uh, just with enough height to do an out in return attempt of rounding the turn point and returning to a near airfield. We were uh, encouraged by our club to land there after completing the task, you know, to have the first experience of landing in another place. I did my math over and over again, and it was plainly possible this out and return would have to be carried out with the speed that uh, was proportional to a 1 to 20 glide ratio for me to round turn point and return to the vertical of the field with 1000 feet AGL or 300 meters. And that was conservative because the sailplane I was flying with, the SED Junior, has a maximum glide ratio of 1 to 35. Man, I did the math over and over but you know calculating is different than doing so eventually i decided to to have a try uh the worst thing that could happen would be outlining and i was prepared for that so i rounded the turn point and re headed to the airfield with each meter counting and suddenly i found a thermal and that was it i climbed and i had enough height to uh return to the field with a lot more margin than I had previously calculated. Well, I had achieved the badge. I landed on the airfield and I was later picked up by the club stow plane. My navigation was completed with a cross-country speed of 35 km per hour, with only 18 knots. Yeah, it's super slow, but my advice for every pilot out there intend to do this this year is to pick a long day and don't worry about speed. This is not a competition, it's just your first navigation. Focus on completing the task, on correctly around the turn points, pick up and align good lift sources on the way, and that's it. Speed will be your concern for your gold badge, but not this one. But do you know what else I learned from my first 50 km flight? To think positive. If you've done your part preparing, planning, and taking reasonable decisions, the tie is in your side, don't worry. Just fly the sailplane, find good lift sources, and fly straight to your goal. And enjoy the experience, because it, the feeling of uh, accomplishing the Silver Badge is great. That's it, guys. I hope that this helps you on your attempt. For everyone else who has already achieved the badge, I know that this segment will bring up good memories as well. This February, I'm going to open a new Surrey Master course class. It's an online course which teaches the first training method designed for Surrey pilots that greatly improves pilots' performance. Pilots from more than 15 different countries have already enrolled in this course, and it's open once a year. And if you're interested, go to SurreyMaster.com and pre-register yourself. That's it. See you next one, guys. Bye. If you would like to say hi and let us know where you are enjoying the podcast, we would love to hear from you. If you are a glider pilot and want to share your aviation journey, contact us at chuck at soaringthesky.com or send us a message on our website at soaringthesky.com and Chuck will get in touch with you. We hope you join us next time for another soaring adventure here on Soaring the Sky, a glider pilot's podcast. Soaring the Sky is written and produced by Chuck Fulton. Original music for the podcast was written and produced by Kim Spangler. Graphic design for the podcast was created by Zachary Fulton. Voiceover work was done by Michelle Perez.